Okay. Okay. Um, it's doing something. Look out, look on your phone, see right that request app. Boom. Okay. It's, uh, just one sec yeah. second because uh, yeah. I'm getting a, a security update thing. Ah, who knows? Yeah. Okay, as long as you can see the screen, everything is fine. Yeah. Uh, Windows can sort itself out later. Um, okay, so let me just make sure that we. Uh, okay, so um, last time we we were sort of finishing off the uh, the session about energy and this and climate change, but we didn't I didn't fully finish the climate part. Um, now it's clear that these are topics which we're going to certainly the let's say the more uh, technical aspects of the climate change uh, we're going to look at in a little bit more detail in another session um, in the future but the the idea was to uh, to just finish the connection with the energy uh, the energy section so um, I'm just going to run through a couple of a couple of slides about this, and then I'm going to switch over to the topic for today, which is actually um, we're going to start to have a look at plastics. Um, so, just to sort of carry on uh, carry on the um, the conversation about uh, climate change, we talked about. Um, we talked about how we have different types of energy, we get energy from different sources, um, but of course one of the key problems at the moment is that um, a lot of the energy which we use comes from, well in fact not, not a lot, most of the energy that we use comes from sources which are not sustainable environmentally. and what that means in in most cases is that the um, the fuels themselves or the the energy sources themselves are in some way related to um, the production of carbon dioxide and that's the big link between energy use and uh, and climate change because the production of carbon dioxide is unavoidable if you are using any form of uh, energy source which requires direct combustion so um, we talked about we talked about uh, oil and gas and different types of petrol uh, we talked about fuels like biofuels, for example, um, and all of these uh, all of these sources of uh, energy have um, at their core carbon, and carbon is the problem in the sense that uh, what carbon is a, is an, an an element which is essential for life, but at the same time. Um, it's something which we have uh, over the last 150 years been putting back into the atmosphere uh, at, a, at an ever increasing rate um, and as I've alluded to several times during the during during these these talks um, while the numbers the, the 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 numbers that we see the amounts of uh, of increase of average temperature the amounts in terms of abs absolute quantities may not seem uh, so uh, so large um, these systems are such the earth uh, the earth system is is such that um, very small changes can have very big effects and we saw that for example with the, uh, the simply getting the getting power from the wind turbine 
the, the relationship between the uh, wind speed and the amount of power you get is actually a cube relationship, so a cubic relationship. So uh, a, a doubling of wind speed gives you eight times as much energy. So you can see that uh, even from that example, there are, uh, let's say, the, the physics underlying these systems is such that small changes uh, can be amplified. Um, how can we see, uh, how can we measure these effects? Well, uh, since there's been more attention paid to these uh, uh, to these changes, and particularly over the last 20 or 30 years, and it, it's getting, uh, obviously, we're paying ever more attention to this. Um, there are different measures that people use, but we can also imagine that uh, these different measures also indicate different effects on different groups of people. So, for example, uh, the increase in sea levels, uh, the increase in uh, greenhouse gases in, in general, such as carbon dioxide, methane, uh, and uh, other some other gases. Um, increase in surface temperature, uh, retreat of glaciers, so um, this is one which is very, very, uh, let's say, present in the uh, in mountain areas which are uh, associated with uh, with glaciers. So, for example, the Dolomites and the Alps. Um, extreme weather events, and I think this is something which I th I think everybody is having, uh, has some sort of, let's say, um, uh, knowledge or, or, or experience of, uh, certainly, because these are, uh, these are uh, events which seem to be getting uh, more and more common. Um, uh, acidification of oceans, of the oceans, I think most of us will have seen pictures of coral uh, coral reefs which are uh, which are dying off um, and also uh, the warming of the oceans because there is uh, uh, there is a let's say a, a, there's a series of effects going on at the same time so these are some of the measures uh, which are some of the the lines of evidence which are used to uh, let's say to underline the fact that um, things are changing, and it's not just uh, it's not just let's say a, a, a blip on the uh, on the chart. Things are things are changing. Um, it's true the world was a lot warmer back in the time of the dinosaurs, but that's not saying that the world back in the time of dinosaur, the dinosaurs was suitable for human habitation. So um, I think this is uh, we have constructed uh, human civilization over the last 10,000 years um, based on a set of, let's say, uh, more or less stable uh, climate factors. And these climate factors are now um, modifying considerably. Such that uh, such that some of the uh, some of the things that we have constructed are no longer um, let's say no or becoming potentially unviable. Okay, so um, as you as you probably picked up, I do I do quite like music, and so this is uh, of course Jimi Hendrix, um, and if anybody wants to. Here, here, an example of uh, feedback. Uh, um, Jimi Hendrix is the absolute, uh, let's say, um, uh, the absolute professional as far as uh, the feedback is concerned. Um, I'd suggest uh, the recording of Star, Star Spangled Banner from uh, Woodstock is the absolute classic. What's this got to do with climate? Well, Climate is uh, the climate system. Systems in general are made or are constructed of feedback loops. Um, this is true of climate, uh, the climate system. It's true of metabolic systems. It's true of supply chain systems. Surprisingly, it's true of most uh, of all complex systems. You have 
uh, a set of interconnected loops which um, which together all together create the behavior of the system um, uh, this is uh, not to get too technical but this is what's called an emergent property so from the um, uh, f let's say from the various pieces in the system you cannot predict how the thing is actually going to behave unless you understand the connections between the pieces and you can get behaviors which go beyond the individual parts so this really is an example just like human consciousness of the full system being much more than the sum of its parts okay so feedback is typically of two types we have positive feedback and negative feedback um, quite simply the positive feedback uh, which is not when your boss says you've done a good job this is when uh, a signal or an input into a process uh, comes out of the process and the process actually amplify it comes back into the process again and it amplifies again so essentially it loops out of control this is what uh, this is what our friend Jimmy was doing when he was uh, uh, when he was playing with his guitar in front of his amplifier um, the opposite to positive feedback of course is negative feedback and this is um, this is where the output of the process comes back back onto the input and it reduces it okay so it dampens down so in other words um, the positive feedback will take things out of control make things go haywire whereas the negative feedback will keep things under control so um, in any system you will need a balance of these uh, of these uh, these loops so just to give you a, um, a, f a feedback example here uh, as far as climate is concerned um, as the water as the water evaporates you get more clouds <clears throat> if you get more clouds you get more reflection of uh, solar radiation okay if you reflect more so if you remember the, the the solar radiation comes down through the atmosphere and warms up the atmosphere but a lot of it is reflected back if you reflect a lot of light back from the clouds a lot of radio solar radiation from the clouds um, this will keep the temperature on the uh, on the uh, on the, the surface uh, lower okay so it has an effect of reducing the temperature on the uh, on the on the surface so what will happen in this type of case is that you will have um, a balance what you actually see is a balance of uh, of the um, of the evaporation and the reflection reflection of the uh, of the energy okay um, positive feedback on the other hand this is another example from or oh, there are actually two examples here uh, another example from uh, climate change is um, thinking about uh, mel melting glaciers and in particular in um, in Greenland uh, so we, we've had some recent reports of um, rain rain in the center of the uh, the Greenland ice uh, ice field um, what happens when ice from glaciers melts what happens when glaciers disappear is you change what's called the al albedo um, that's the pronunciation in, uh, in English I don't think it's the same in Italian um, but basically what this means is that more energy according to the color the color of the of the surface uh, more or less energy will be reflected more or less heat will be absorbed so ice is uh, is a light color so it reflects a lot of energy typically the rock underneath is a lot darker so once that rock is exposed it will absorb more energy it will absorb more heat 
as it absorbs more heat it increases the temperature in the uh, in the atmosphere because it absorbs heat and then it gives it back out again that will create um, that creates an increase in temperature which melts the ice and so uh, and so on and so forth so um, that's one example of a positive feedback loop another is the um, acidification of uh, or the amount of sorry the amount of water in sorry the amount of co2 in the oceans so um, if you uh, heat the heat the oceans up a little bit, um, they will release uh, more CO2. Okay, um, and more CO2 into the atmosphere increases increases the temperature, which increases the temperature of the ocean, which means more CO2 is released into the atmosphere. So, essentially, this you can see this is sort of a it's like a spiral. This is a, a good way of describing um, positive feedback. This has an effect on uh, on acidification. So, um, acidification of the oceans is a is a very big problem um, because it cha it changes the chemistry of the seawater, and we don't we don't think about this usually. Uh, please oh, sorry. Okay. Um, we don't usually think about this because um, we're sort of busy doing our normal stuff. But the sea is a solution, and it contains all sorts of stuff, which all sorts of ions and elements and stuff, which uh, the animals that live in the sea uh, use <coughs> to. Um, carry on with their, their, with their lives let's say um, and in particular there are animals which use uh, which extract carbon dioxide or carbonate from seawater to create their shells um, but this is actually an equilibrium process in the sense that um, carbon dioxide uh, accumulated as carbonate is sensitive to acid um, and even small changes in, in acidity can um, disrupt the equilibrium such that the carbonate is no longer uh, is no longer stable. This has an effect on uh, on corals and shells in that it makes them weaker. Um, and in some cases, it's the animals themselves in in the corals which are sensitive to um, sensitive to the 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 amount of of acidity. So, for those of you who are not uh, or who are not scientists or, or who are not chemists and who have completely forgotten what pH actually means. Um, without sort of going into the great into the details of it. It's just a reminder that, um, again, an example of small changes actually have big effects because the pH scale is actually logarithmic, which means that it doesn't increase 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It increases as a curve. So a small change, a small change can have a very big effect, and in fact, a pH change of 0 0.1, which doesn't sound like very much at all, um, corresponds to an increase in acidity of about 30%, which does sound a bit, a bit more serious, yeah. Um, and so this is the this is the this is the situation that um, we have since well uh, since industrialization and since the the uh, the increase in use of carbon dioxide we have ever uh, let's say ever increasing uh, concentration of uh, acid in the uh, in the oceans uh, and this corresponds to um, the pH uh, becoming more acid so it's becoming it's lowering okay 
Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, oysters, clams, sea urchins, all of these, uh, all of these types of organisms, the the plankton, the plankton which are calcareous, in other words, they have uh, exoskeletons. Um, these are all organisms which are particularly vulnerable, and the um, the small organisms in particular. Uh, extremely important in the in the food chains if you remember way way back we talked about the connection between different organisms in the in the food chains so um, at the moment the predictions are that now this is by the end of the century okay so the 21st century um, the oceans will be about 150 percent more acidic uh, than they are now, which is close to acidity levels over which were seen uh, last seen 20 million years ago. What does that mean? Well, you can say, okay, well, this means that, that, that once upon a time the ocean was a lot more acidic. Yes, it was. The thing is that life had millions of years to adapt to those changes. That's the, the difference here, is that we are seeing catastrophic changes in the sense that, that we are seeing big changes over small periods of time. Um, in a way, it's the equi sort of the equivalent of being hit by an asteroid in the sense that the change is, geologically speaking, is pretty, uh, is pretty abrupt. The other problem is that we are living on this planet now, okay, whereas when the dinosaurs were around and the asteroid struck, um, people were, well, apart from in some films, Hollywood films, um, people weren't, uh, weren't around to see the, uh, the effect. So, of course, um, something like ocean acidity will have a big, uh, a big impact on uh, on people because uh, the sea is uh, a major source of um, economic activities and it's a major source of protein um, we'll meet this again when we talk about uh, when we talk about food food supply um, but it's clear that um, the oceans are not in a not in a very good state um, rising sea levels, uh, so the, of course this is linked to the idea of the glaciers melting, um, and again we have numbers, we have quantities of, uh, of water frozen in the ice caps in the Arctic and in Antarctica, which um, the numbers, uh, I don't think they really mean anything because they're just, these numbers are just so huge, but we can see that, um, uh, you, or you can see that uh, the, the effect of these large amounts of, of water, uh, these large amounts of ice turning into water, um, will have a, obviously will have a major effect on uh, on the sea, and so we're, we're talking about um, a twenty centimeter rise over a hundred years. Um, but the rate of in, the rate of increase is increasing. So uh, sea levels are rising, but they're getting fast. This rise is accelerating. Okay. Um, this is a headline from September this year, okay, uh, rain falling on Greenland's ice sheet. Uh, this is, um, this is the stuff of science fiction not so long ago, but, nine, but 2030 is literally just around the corner. Um, and it's sort of, well, it can get very alarmist and you can also get rather, let's say, defeatist about it. Um, but it's just to give an, give an idea of the situation. So, um, 
how does this work? Well, I've mentioned the uh, the positive feedback loop of the exposed rock absorbing more heat than the ice, and so the temperature, uh, so that the, the solar energy is captured and then released back into the Earth system rather than just being reflected back. Um, the other aspect is that uh, increasing temperatures causes water molecules to move around a little bit faster. Um, this is thermal expansion, and so there's a there's an expansion of the uh, of the um, of the volume of water. Uh, so, um, in general, in general, the um, ice melting is not the same all over the place. Um, so some <coughs> some places are, are melting a bit quicker. Now notice we're talking about two millimeters per year. So you're probably thinking, how do they measure that? Well, uh, the measurements are obviously averages, but the sampling these days uh, is done on such a scale using very very accurate satellite uh, measurements that um, these numbers become uh, they get better and better in terms of the quality of the data they get more and more depressing <laughs> in terms of the meaning of the data two millimeters two millimeters does not sound like uh, does not sound like very much um, but we're comparing that to our scale, our, our human scale, and we are not factoring in time. And the fact is that uh, we are talking about geological type processes, but on a on a human time scale. So um, two millimeters may not sound like a lot. Ten years, well, that's twenty twenty millimeters. That's two centimeters. Maybe about this much doesn't sound like a lot to me um, but if we say okay that's 10 years well 20 centimeters in a hundred years well I won't be around in a hundred years but maybe my children will be um, a thousand years okay well that's uh, 20 cents that's 200 centimeters that's two meters in a thousand years well a thousand years for the earth Earth's time scale is nothing it's nothing so um, these are effects which are uh, are going to have major major consequences because we think about um, I think when we think about the uh, uh, rising sea levels we tend to think about uh, Venice uh, Venice being submerged uh, maybe uh, the Netherlands which is uh, obviously in uh, a little bit of uh, danger um, but we don't tend to think about the other uh, aspects, which are, or which, which are that um, as seawater rises, it infiltrates in land and it infiltrates into aquifers. It po essentially it poisons the, 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 the groundwater in the sense that it becomes too too salty to 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 be used. Um, for agriculture, for plants, and so you get a, a, a degradation of the environment uh, because of that, um, because of the infiltration of, uh, of salt, salt water uh, along coasts. Um, when you have higher sea levels, when you basically when you have more liquid water around in general, because that's what this means, um, in a warmer world, you have um, more evaporation. When you have more evaporation, you have more water vapor in the atmosphere. When you have more water vapor in the atmosphere, you have more energy in the atmosphere, and that leads to more powerful, uh, more powerful weather events in which this energy has to be dissipated. Remember, uh, I think we talked, we mentioned this a couple of times, a couple of weeks ago, that this energy is coming in and it has to be shared out across the system. Yeah, uh, but if, because of the sh because of the way the Earth is, the Earth is a is a sphere which is spinning in space. Um, half of the Earth is receiving the energy and the other half isn't the other half is actually radiating so 
we have this these this weather process which is or these weather processes which are dissipating the energy through the system um, and with more energy around it you can imagine that we will have more um, we will see more events in which the energy is is being shared through the system okay um, the photograph is from it's from the Great Depression in the US in the, the, the 1930s, early 1930s. This is very much John Steinbeck. Uh, if anyone is interested in the literature of this era, era um, uh, East, of, East of Eden is the, uh, is the, classic, uh, is the classic book um, which, deals with, uh, which deals with this. And it's, it's about migration because people will move if they have to move, people will move, and so um, there's going to be all sorts of uh, uh, all sorts of migratory events which will happen. Um, so there's, this is just a list of some of the major cities which are uh, th uh, potentially threatened. Um, to this, we could add something like I think it's about 80, 70, 80 percent of the Netherlands, uh, which, of course, because of the way it is, uh, has historically been uh, built on um, land reclaimed from the sea. Um, here, you can see that there are some big and some famous cities. If you go around on the internet, you will find a map, or you will find maps of Florida. Um, projected into the sort of 2050, 2060, 2070 um, and you will see uh, because a lot of Florida is low-lying land um, there's a lot of uh, the, a lot of that land will end up under under the sea okay so um, I don't know whether anyone's got any any comments about uh, any comments about that. Um, if you will, uh, if you'll forgive me just two seconds, I'm just going to change uh, change slides. Okay, so I'm going to move into talking about plastics. But on the, in the meantime, if anyone has any questions about the the feedback uh, the feedback loops, because under, I think understanding feedback loops is um, is is key to uh, key to this idea of complex systems, um, and it was interesting that the uh, the guys who uh, got the Nobel Prize for Physics this year were um, people who worked on uh, work in uh, the the areas of complexity and complex uh, complex systems. Um, finally. Uh, <laughs> finally, this is uh, this area which is extremely, uh, extremely relevant. Um, finally, this area is getting uh, uh, getting the re the the recognition that it uh, it deserves. Okay, um, I'm assuming that my slides are still visible. Let me just check. Yes, there's still the green border. Okay. Right, so um, yeah, the timetable is a little bit out of whack, but I'm not too worried because I'm, I will be bringing, I'll be coming back to, uh, we'll be coming back to the sustainable cities. Uh, we'll be coming back to the, let's say the, the uh, the flow of the, of the of the calendar. So I'm not too worried about uh, being a little bit, <coughs> a little bit out of uh, out of sync. Okay, so um, what what I'd like to uh, what I'd like to sort of uh, talk about today is um, this uh, one of the aspects of um, of the environment and environmental English, which of course is very relevant to our modern society and that's uh, to do with plastics um, in particular um, I think if we were to define a material which 
or if we were to name a material which defines the age in which we live, I think most of us would uh, default to plastics of some sort. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at um, uh, going to look, I'm going to look at uh, some different aspects of plastics. Um, there's a little bit of sciencey stuff in here. Uh, I can't really avoid that. Um, but what I want to try and get across here is that. Uh, okay, can I? No, this is, sorry. Just there is a question on. Uh, on the chat, which I'm going to answer uh, verbally, but I will read the question out. Um, okay, Irene is saying, heating the earth happens due to the atmospheric, atmospheric layer. I guess that the color of the surface has only little impact. Is this so? No, this is not so, actually. Um, the color of the surface has a big impact, and if you want a demonstration of this uh, on a nice sunny day, even in the winter, in fact, it's more impressive in the winter. If you take a piece of white paper and a piece of black paper outside in the sun, you will see, you will feel that the black paper gets warmer, whereas the white paper doesn't get so warm. Um, this is a very, very crude representation of albedo, albedo, which is the um, uh, the the ability of a surface to reflect or absorb energy. Okay, um, it's true that the let's say the energy in the Earth system in the atmosphere is the energy which is which causes the problems of storms and what have you, and the, and it also causes the pro, let's say the problem of the of the the, the warming in general. Um, but it's the, the surface has a the surface of the earth has a major um, has a major impact on the energy in the atmosphere because if if you think about it um, and again this is something that you can you can uh, demonstrate in uh, uh, in the summertime uh, if you take a, a wall of the house which is facing south it will get warm in the summer. As the sun goes down, it doesn't get cold straight away. It radiates back the heat that it has, ab has absorbed, just in the same way as the Earth's surface will radiate back the heat that it absorbs. Okay, so um, so Irina, the, the color of the surface is actually very, very important. If you're interested in doing some, I don't know which age group of, stu of, uh, of pupils or students you work with, but if you're interested in doing, um, let's say, experiments about heat, uh, you can do some. You can do quite a lot of stuff with relatively simple equipment. Um, even simple things like a, 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 a jar, a jam jar with a thermometer, and you paint it black and you put it in the sun, compared to one which isn't painted black, you can really see the difference between uh, um, things which absorb heat and things which don't. Okay, I hope I've answered your question, Irina. Is that okay? Uh, I'll see if. Message comes up. Okay, so come <laughs> come back to the come back to this uh, the thing about plastics. Now, you are probably you are probably wondering what the graduate has to do with plastics. Um, well, there are actually two two things, but uh, it's not Anne Bancroft's leg that I'm particularly interested in here. Um, it's a, it was an introduction to a particular scene in the film. Which unfortunately I can't show because it's uh, um, for copyright reasons. Um, but I do have the dialogue. Um, it's at the beginning of the film. Uh, for those of you who who have never seen it, it's a film that's well worth seeing. It's uh, it's a film of its time, but it remains a classic. Um, okay, so the situation is this: there's a conversation between. Okay, this is Benjamin uh, Dustin Hoffman. Um, he's just graduated, 
hence the name of the film. Um, not sure what he's graduated in, but he's just graduated, and he's, his parents are throwing a party uh, in which they've invited all of their, their friends. I think he's graduated from Harvard or something like that. He's, uh, he's one of the, the top-notch universities, and everyone is really sort of pleased and excited. Um, and so at the party, there is... Uh, there is this Mr. Maguire who is a family friend and he has this conversation with Benjamin who um, the character is not is not very loquacious let's say he's a little bit uh, a little bit taciturn um, so Mr. Maguire I want to say one word to you just one word okay Benjamin yes sir are you listening yes I am plastics says Mr. Maguire Exactly how do you mean? Mr. Maguire, there's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Now, this is interesting because this is in the uh, mid-60s, mid-60s, and at that point in time, it was thought that there was a great fu future in plastics, and plastics, like we mentioned about nuclear power, uh, sort of seemed to represent modernity and the new future and the great, uh, great bright new world that's just around the corner. Um, probably they didn't have this in mind, though. I don't think. Um, and I think for us now, this is uh, this is an image that we would associate uh, quite strongly with plastics. We wouldn't associate the uh, the idea of modernity, the idea of uh, new materials that are great and, and, uh, and have all of these uh, beneficial uh, properties. Um, and in fact, if I, th if I think about it uh, growing up when I was a kid, if you describe something as being, oh, it, it, uh, it's made of plastic, <laughs> now it's not that I di I didn't grow up in the in in the Middle Ages. It's not like I grew up in the, in medieval times. Um, but there was an element of uh, it's a bit plasticky, yeah. So um, I think what we need to think about when we when we're talking about plastics is that um, plastics are there. For exist for a reason. Um, plastics have been developed for reasons um, and what has not been considered is the, is the uh, it's the usual thing, what has not been considered is the effect of the plastics on, uh, on a large scale um, after we've used them. Okay, so um, if we if we look at if we look at plastics, uh, if we look at the word, um, plastic is actually not a it's actually physical property rather than a thing itself, um, and it's used to describe uh, polymeric materials. Uh, we'll talk about what polymers are in a minute, um, but usually. Um, and this is true for most plastics which are most things which are we would class as plastic um, these polymers are mixed with other things other chemical uh, agents to improve their properties okay so um, for example I'm looking at my screen and I've realized that I haven't taken off the uh, the plastic film which, prote which protects the edge of the screen um, that plastic film is uh, will probably be a polypropylene of some description um, but it's it also includes something which makes it more flexible okay um, so this is this will be a f one of the famous plasticizers, and why do people well why do we do this? Well, it's to do with performance. 
most plastics are the way they are because they have they have particular properties and it, it's the particular properties that um, that we use that we need uh, which make plastics so useful sometimes uh, things plastics are used to reduce costs because an equivalent piece may may be made but in metal or in wood or in glass um, but more often than not it's actually the performance of the material which is uh, which is important okay so um, plastics are uh, sim a symbol of the symbolic of modernity in a way um, and it seems a bit strange or it's maybe a bit stupid to say plastics are plastic well of course plastic means that you can deform you can mold you can uh, create many many different shapes okay uh, and so this is what we're going to have a look at uh, have a look at today uh, many different kinds of plastics for different things each time okay and yes each time that I go to the supermarket not often I look around and I think that in a few hours all I see will be garbage it's horrible we live in a huge landfill um, well yes <laughs> unfortunately um, and we'll come to we'll meet we'll meet the let's say how uh, plastics are um, uh, how plastics are used because uh, uh, it's something I think it's about 40% of plastics are used for packaging so that explains why we see these things uh, so prevalently prevalently in places like supermarkets okay um so just a uh, just a few words about um the anthropocene which you may or may not have heard of um this is a cover of the economist from a few years ago um, and it talks about the Anthropocene. Um, scene is a, um, in this sense, is a, it's a, it's a, a suffix which is used to describe a geological epoch, um, um, in particular after the dinosaurs. So um, up until up until recently we would describe ourselves as living in the Holocene um, but uh, the Anthropocene is is a word which has been uh, coined to describe well basically to encapsulate the fact that um, man's present on presence on the planet is now having such a, a major effect that in the future uh, whatever happens in the future, uh, future alien geologists coming to look at planet Earth would find, even if there were no people around, uh, they would find geological evidence of um, changes. Okay, um, and a lot of that evidence will be associated with plastic. There's more plastic produced than steel every year. Um, it's used in all sorts of things. Um, most of it is made from non-renewable uh, resources such as oil, coal or natural gas. Um, and of course, as Agnès has just uh, alluded to and as we saw in the photograph, um, plastic waste is one of the big, big problems already even without plastic waste, uh, many uh, communities, many cities uh, have problems with waste disposal. Um, but this uh, plastic is just adding to the um, adding to the problem. So the big question here is our need, f our our need, our desire for convenient living, but balancing it with a concern for uh, for the environment. Okay, so some these are some numbers. Um, I think this is about 2016, 2017. Uh, the numbers so um, 2.5 billion metric tons of solid waste per year. That's solid waste 
of which 275 million metric tons, that's 275 billion kilos, is plastic. Okay. Um, 100 million metric tons of coastal plastic waste is produced by all of the people around the world living near the coast because many, um, a good proportion of the world po world's population actually lives relatively close to the uh, to the oceans. Um, so there is a lot of uh, a lot of plastic waste uh, being uh, being produced. Okay, so um, although we use the word plastic uh, as if it were a single material, um, of course there are many different types of plastic. Um, they're typically uh, soft and easy to um, easy to work with uh, during manufacture, but then they can become uh, they can be made hard. Uh, they can become uh, they can have all sorts of different types of properties. Um, we also have, so many of these, most of these uh, we think of as being synthetic, um, but we also have many which are derived from natural sources as well. We have some which are derived from natural sources, and there are also some which are sort of uh, somewhere in between. So um, these are plastics. This is uh, spaghetti, but uh, uh, plastics are made of, of polymers, uh, so uh, polymers are typically long chain molecules, that's lots of atoms stuck together um, and they are typically based on carbon uh, because carbon has a, uh, has a, a wonderful property which, uh, which is that it, it's able to bond to itself uh, almost, well, infinitely basically. And so you can make up long chains of uh, carbon atoms. Um, if you add other atoms in, well, you will always have some hydrogen somewhere. Um, but if you add some other atoms in, like oxygens, sulfurs, nitrogens, fluorines, chlorines, um, you can make all sorts of uh, all sorts of molecules, all sorts of big polymers with um, interesting properties or useful properties. Um, so the polymers are made up of monomers, which is the small bit, and that's repeated. So it's a bit like um, it's a bit like Lego. It's a bit like having lots and lots of the same bricks of Lego. Um, if you put them together, you can make uh, you can make all sorts of things. The only thing is that they're all the same. Okay. Well, actually. Lego itself, of course, is uh, is ABS. It's a it's a type of plastic. Um, okay, so uh, polymers will have uh, will have high molecular weights, um, whereas monomers are typically low molecular weight and more reactive. A variant on the plastics are the elastomers. Um, this is a good example. These are, uh, as the name suggests, they exhibit a sort of a, a, like an, a, a properties of rubber-like elasticity, which um, means that they're relatively soft at low temperatures. Uh, relevant, sorry, relatively soft at, at room temperature. Um, actually, at lower temperatures, they can become quite rigid. Um, these types of uh, these types of plastics would be used for uh, for seals. Uh, that's not the animals, but the uh, when you're making joints which have to contain fluids or gases. Okay. Um, also for for molded parts which need to be flexible. So. In some cases, you will have things which need to be able to move, and these will be uh, elastomers. A little bit of chemistry, but don't worry about it. It's just that this slide came from somewhere else, so uh, um, the, the structures are on there, but uh, you don't need to know anything about them at all. Um, basically, most synthetic plastics are made from oil derivatives. 
um, crude oil, as we mentioned in the energy section, is fractionated. So um, you get this horrible sticky stuff from the ground and it is, uh, it's worked up in such a way that it, um, that you, you distill different parts of it. Um, and some of the uh, some of the lighter stuff it's actually the ethylene and the uh, the propylene um the propylene and the ethene which are uh which come off as as gases uh these are um some of the main um, uh, some of the main uh, monomers for for making plastics um so you can play around with some of these fractions, do a little bit of chemistry, and you can get to things like styrene, which is uh, this type of thing, and also vinyl chloride. So I think these are these will be sort of fairly familiar. Um, the classification of plastics is a bit. Um, it's not set in stone. It depends on your your point of view. It depends on what you're looking for. So you may uh, classify plastics according to where they come from, synthetic or natural. You may talk about the details of the chemistry. So you might be talking about polyesters or polyamides. Um, you might be talking about the physical characteristics of plastic or an elastomer. Um, you may be talking about processing characteristics, so um, things like is it a thermoplastic or is it what's called a thermoset. So a thermoplastic is something which is hard and when you heat it it goes soft. Um, a thermoset is something which starts off soft and when you heat it it hardens up. Okay. So um, it depends on what your, uh, let's say, what your, um, what you're looking at uh, in terms of uh, the properties. So thermoplastics, um, it may sound a little bit technical, but certainly this is something which everyone has seen. Um, if you look at, if you look in the supermarket, um, plastic bottles containing any liquid, any material. These are thermoplastics. Um, the, uh, the the advantage of thermoplastics is that you can um, you can shape you can shape them by um, injection molding, um, and uh, as the uh, you do this when it's hot, and when they cool down, you're left with the uh, you're left with the, the plastic bottle. Okay. Um, okay. I'm just going to move on. So, so some typical examples of thermoplastics are your uh, polyethylenes or polythenes. So the plastic bottles and the plastic sheets, um, the polystyrenes. Um, that's used for used for packaging. Uh, polypropylene, which you may have come across um, for. Uh, plastic ropes, that type of thing. Uh, PVC, so toys, credit cards, uh, plastic cards, that type of thing. Um, polycarbonate is the uh, is the plastic equivalent of glass. It's used to replace glass. Um, so it's used in windows. It's used in uh, car headlights. Um, polyamide, uh, nylon. Which is used in everything from, well, uh, stockings, textiles, uh, toothbrushes. Uh, it's used. It's extremely, extremely versatile. And then things like, uh, well, that name there looks a bit, uh, <laughs> a bit daunting. Polytetrafluoroethylene (PTFE), otherwise known as Teflon. Um, and that's obviously used for uh, for coatings. Um, we'll have a look at some of these in a little bit in a little bit more detail uh, in a little while. But um, thermosets are your uh, classic uh, plastic um, plastic bowls, uh, which are maybe they're harder than the. Um, than the plastic that you would use, the plastic bowls that you use as buckets. Yeah, so this is more this is more stuff like um, uh, false ceramic in a way. 
Um, you have things like um, polyurethane, uh, which is used for insulation. You have things like mel melamine, which is uh, almost certainly used, while well, it's used for furniture, it's the IKEA type of furniture, uh, that type of thing. Epoxy resin, uh, which is um, a tough type of plastic which is used for uh, sticking things together and also as a wood substitute. Okay, um, So what's the problem with these is that uh, they can be extremely difficult to recycle because you cannot you can't just melt them and make them into something else uh, it, they're actually quite difficult to uh, they're quite difficult to to, to deal with um, okay so I, I didn't really want to say too much about it. this is a little bit of chemistry but um, to polymerize the the monomers there are two main ways one is to basically add them together uh, this is called uh, addition polymerization, and it's very much like a chain of daisies, like a chain of chain of flowers. It's just literally attaching things. Um, condensation is a little bit different um, because this involves putting two things together and spitting out an extra an extra piece. Um, and the extra piece is typically a water molecule. So, for example, your your plastic bottles, your poly, uh, polyethylene terephthalates, your pet, your PET bottles, the water bottles. This is a, a condensation type of polymerization. Um, and so the advantage, let's say the advantage of this type of, of, of thing, of chemistry, is that um, it creates uh, it creates enough, let's say, places in the plastic itself to be able to do some chemistry to turn it back into uh, the starting materials. Okay, I don't know whether that idea is clear, but um, the problem with the addition polymers like polyethylene is that you just end up with a, a, a long chain of everything is the same thing with the condensation polymers is that you end up with alternating pieces so you have um, you might have a, uh, a a small chain and then there is some polarity and then there's not a small chain and there's something something else then there's some then there's a small chain and there's something else and it's the fact that you have a, an you have an alternating structure which allows you to um, eventually uh, degrade the uh, degrade the polymer. Okay. Uh, okay. So one of the other aspects of uh, polymer uh, polymers is they need catalysts. You need catalysts to make them. Uh, this is a guy called uh, Giulio Natta, who is a, an Italian uh, chemical engineer, uh, who uh, together with Carl Ziegler developed. Um, fundamentally important catalysts for making um, uh, for making poly uh, polypropylene in a way which really changed the properties of the of the uh, of the molecule. Okay, so I mentioned that we will ha almost typically, almost certainly have. Um, different ingredients so we'll have uh, colors uh, quite often plastics are, so are associated with uh, bright happy colors typically for for children's toys uh, but also for other things for advertisements or what have you um, plasticizers to make something flexible viscous easier to shape um, stabilizers to stop the plastic actually breaking apart uh, you may have fillers, uh, which are um, typically low-cost minerals, and you would add fillers to reduce the overall cost of the, the final product. Because again, we have to remember that all of this is being done uh, under, let's say, economic constraints, which is that uh, these are products which are being sold, and so uh, any way of 
getting the same result but cheaper uh, will be uh, will be used. Um, this also contributes to some of the problems of um, what do you actually do with the plastics when you uh, when you come to recycle them, because if you have plastics which are combina uh, combinations of components, um, they can be difficult to uh, they can be difficult to um, uh, they can be difficult to recycle. Okay, uh, so usually uh, after the synthesis you end up with uh, a resin which um, is uh, typically found in, well, typically comes out as small beads uh, or powders or grains and um, what you do is you, um, you load these into a machine and then you heat it up and you start to to process so this is the let's say this is the raw material of the uh of the of the plastic itself uh, uh yeah okay now um Bru uh, bruna okay if you just um just hold on a little while i'm going to say something about henry henry ford um it's not actually hemp that he used but you will see in a in a in a few minutes. Um, okay, so okay, so basically you've got the resin and you put it into a machine. You can do uh, this is processing, so you you can do processing in different ways. Um, injection molding. Uh, that's typically for. Um, uh, for sort of complex parts or particular parts which have particular shapes so you basically melt the stuff and you put it into a into a mold this is very similar to um, uh, making um, making metal parts and in fact there is injection mold injection molding was invented for working metals and then it was adapted for uh, working plastics um, where you have a mold <coughs> and you pour the metal in uh, you let it cool and then you open the mold okay <coughs> The blow molding. This is how bottles are made. Um, and if you ever get the chance, if you ever get the chance to go to a bottle making factory, a bottling factory, it's um, it's really quite fascinating to see these machines work um, because this is done uh, extremely quickly. Uh, and basically, you have a uh, you have a. a um, a plastic, let's say the, the the resin part will be in a in a shape, and you uh, it, it is heated up, and then uh, air is blown in, and while the ha while the plastic is ex is still hot, uh, air is blown in, and it expands to make your bottle, and you will have a shape that's maybe this like a tube that's like this size, and it will become a two liter Coke bottle. Okay. So it's quite um, uh, okay. Extrusion is uh, sim. Yeah, the, the, there's a word here. Spinneret. Um, spinnerets are what spiders have to spin their silk, um, which is also a polymer. Um, and this is the let's say the the human equivalent. Uh, it's the copy. It's a microscopically small sieve, which basically extrudes the uh, the polymer as a as a fibre. This is then taken and woven into uh, um, into fibres, which into fibres which can be used for making textiles and such like. Um, calendaring. This is maybe a bit less familiar um, this is how how uh, smooth smooth sheets are made okay so it's a, a set of rollers which are used to uh, basically um, flatten out uh, the the the, the, uh, the plastic in a way it's sort of very similar to making lasagna okay um, you start off with a lump, <laughs> a lump of pasta, and you put it through the the pasta making machine, um, 
a few times and it comes out ever thin you, and you you make the rollers closer and closer together and it comes out eventually as uh, um, it comes out eventually as a as a as a, a thin layer of, uh, of pasta okay so um, just going to give a little bit of background to uh, to some different types of, pl of plastics and some sort of sense of, of timing because uh, again we take these things for granted but they haven't always been around so um, historically uh, um, before about 1850 or so um, there was no such thing as plastic in the term that in the way that we understand it um, People had access to things like amber. Uh, they had access to uh, natural resins, shellac, uh, gutta percha, which is um, natural rubber, cellulose, uh, gelatin from animals and from fish. Um, but one of the big problems with any of these any of these natural resins and polymers is that they do not have particularly good physical or mechanical properties and um, around about well around about 1840 uh, that may this may be a little bit small but it, it, we're going to look at some of the details going along so um, Charles Goodyear uh, created or invented the, the, the vulcanization um, the vulcanization uh, process which is uh, a way of making natural rubber more resistant and more um, uh, more let's say more flexible in its uses so um, that's back in uh, that's back in 1840, 1839. Um, around about, well, it's the history of modern plastics really starts from about 1850 onwards. So um, it's around about this time that a couple of people uh, were playing around with uh, nitrocellulose, which is not the safest thing to be playing around with. Um, there was a guy called Parks. Uh, actually patented a, 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 um, a form of nitrocellulose which he called parkazine. Um, people in the past were not so um, uh, were not so shy about uh, self-promotion let's say um, but at the same time uh, there's an interesting history around uh, around all of this because um, it's the time of uh, the development of um, uh, nitroglycerine, which is not a polymer, but uh, which is an explosive nitrocellulose, um, and this sort of links to uh, links to Nobel. Uh, well, we'll come to him in a minute. Um, 1846 so is just a little bit before Parks. Parks actually produced a patent, but Schoenbein, um was messing, literally messing around with uh, cellulose in the kitchen uh, and uh, well actually no he was messing around with nitration, a nitration experiment and he spilt it and so he used a cloth to wipe up the, uh, wipe up the, the mess and the cloth was cotton of course um, and he, uh, he, he dried it <laughs> He tried it against the, uh, the, the the stove, and uh, at some point it just went woof because uh, nitrocellulose, as it's called, gun cotton, is extremely flammable stuff. And from there, there's a whole set of, uh, let's say, a whole a whole um, industry uh, developed around the use of, around the, the making of this stuff, which is extremely dangerous. Um, Nobel, uh, most of us, uh, would recognize Nobel from the Nobel prizes. Um, you may or may not know that, uh, one of the things which Nobel, uh, was, let's say, uh, driven by was, um, 
was to find a substitute for uh, nitroglycerine because nitroglycerine at the time was used for um, civil engineering projects and this is the mid late yeah it's the, the second half of the 1800s expansion of the railways and in particular in, con in countries like um, Sweden where uh, there was a need for uh, tunneling um, there was a need for, and tunneling with normal tools was extremely slow and extremely expensive um, there was a need for uh, civil explo for explosives for civil engineering purposes, but of course it's a bit like nuclear, or it's a bit like well most things you can uh, just as you can use things for the good you can use things for the bad, and uh, Nobel uh, was working for um, was working towards uh, an industrial process for making nitroglycerine which is extremely dangerous stuff um, and his brother was killed in a factory accident and so this uh, this spurred Nobel to uh, to look for um, alternatives and eventually he created dynamite which is a mixture of silica uh, silica powder and um, uh, trinitroglycerine uh, which could be transported, and it wasn't da it wasn't dangerous until you actually lit the fuse. Um, and of course, Nobel, by the end of his life, was uh, extremely conscious of the let's say of the damage that he had done by introducing this material. But at the same time, um, this was the material which allowed p allowed. Um, uh, allowed Europe to be connected by railways, it allowed the expansion of the railways in South America, North America and other places as well so um, it's one of those things which is a bit of a, a double-edged uh, double sword um, but maybe you are not so familiar or with the fact that nitrocellulose was actually used in the first films for making photographic film and this was Eastman, Eastman Kodak um, uh, so uh, this is this is one of those things where um, the projecting rooms in cinemas were quite often uh, isolated by um, fireproof doors and were <coughs> empty of anything which could possibly be um, flammable simply because having reels of film, <laughs> reels of nitrocellulose film uh, going through a projector there was a risk that the, uh, that the whole thing would, would burn Okay, and in fact, this this is a um, an advert from um, the uh, from a, an accident back in uh, back in the 1800s uh, with a uh, um, no, sorry, this is the early 1900s, uh, uh, but it was an accident in uh, in Hollywood studio. Um, okay, so this guy is Rockefeller, uh, and he is the reason why oil became dominant um, because he basically integrated the whole oil, su oil supply chain from uh, digging it out to selling it and this gave a major push to the development of cars so Henry Ford um, but it also gave a major push to the development of plastics in the sense that um, up until that time people were were playing with biologically produced polymers and they were trying to chemically modify them and do all sorts of stuff um, but a lot of that became obsolete very very quickly almost overnight um, with the availability of oil so uh, one of the 
One of the plastics, one of the early plastics which was developed was Bakelite, uh, another, <laughs> another, another compound which is named after its inventor, Bakelund. Um, and this, of course, uh, is for us now, it's rather, it's associated with vintage. So if, we see, if you see vintage buttons or if you see vintage telephones uh, or vintage radios, um, this is the this is the material that you would uh, that you would associate with these these objects. So it's it's actually quite uh, quite iconic, and the fact that these materials these objects are still around actually gives you an idea as to uh, how uh, how resistant excuse me how resistant this stuff is. So this is. Um, this is the first example of a thermoset. So it starts off as a liquid, starts off soft, and you heat it and it toughens up. And Bakelite, as we know, is pretty pretty resistant stuff. Okay, so from about the 1920s onwards, um, there was a, let's say, literally an explosion in the development of, of plastics. So uh, there were many companies uh, across the world working uh, in this area, DuPont in, in America, um, BASF in Germany, along with uh, IG Farben, uh, ICI in period chemicals industry in the UK, um, and this was really the time when a lot of the materials that we recognise now uh, started to become um, available. So things like neoprene, nylon, polyester, polyethylene. Um, so we had yes, okay. So we're coming to the uh, we're coming to the the Henry Ford and the hemp car, uh, the Great Depression. So uh, late 1920s, early 1930s, and here it is. The so it wasn't actually hemp; it was soybean. Um, and this was this was an interesting example of. Um, uh, early experimentation in uh, bioplastics uh, and Ford had the idea of being able to um, being able to somehow help the, the soybean farmers by um, using waste from the soybean production to produce uh, certain internal parts of the um, uh, of the car uh, and certain parts of the shell so the uh, it's interesting because the car was actually about a third lighter than um, other uh, other the normal cars at the time. Um, so this was uh, this was one of uh, one of the early let's say uh, early examples of a major industrial push to use something which is more uh, recyclable because in, in essence this is soybean waste uh, which is being re repurposed. Um, however, of course this didn't last very long because once the depression started to end and the economy started to take off, um, uh, this be actually became too expensive. Okay, um, 1930s, still around about uh, 1930s, DuPont, uh, a guy called uh, Wallace Carruthers. Um, Carruthers is famous, is most famous for nylon, for having discovered nylon, which sort of is the, um, uh, let's say, the, the connection back to the, the poster with uh, Anne Bancroft's leg. Um, but he also invented neoprene. So if anybody here goes uh, surfing or does anything with a wetsuit, um, this is the guy who uh, this is the guy who essentially invented this material, um, and it's more or less same as it ever was. Um, it has big advantages over natural rubber. Um, it's uh, it can be used in most of the same situations, but it's uh, it's much more resistant. Uh, it's much stronger, and um, it also has the advantage of it's actually a lot quicker to make. So, um, in general, it's uh, it's superior to the uh, to the natural product. Um, Carruthers 
although he invented neoprene, as I said, his name is mostly associated with nylon. Um, and the, the nylon was, uh, he discovered nylon by accident uh, in the late 1930s, and it was about to go, it was about to be commercialized in a big scale when the Second World War uh, broke out. Now, one of the first things that was noticed about nylon is that um, it is a it is an analog of silk in the sense that it has very similar properties to silk um, and it can be used in it can be used to substitute for silk in many uh, in many uh, different uh, contexts and one of those uh, one of those contexts was the um, the uh, the preparation of textiles uh, and in particular the preparation of uh, materials for parachutes and for military use and in fact um, the availability of large amounts of nylon um, was fundamental for the planning around the uh, around the D-Day campaigns in Europe uh, in 1944, simply because uh, there was not enough silk. Uh, silk production was not uh, uh, was not there was not enough silk production um, to possibly make meet the demand for uh, for the parachutes. Um, and then, of course, uh, is, it is true, Agnese. It is just crazy. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure what that means, but okay. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, the the other thing is that um, uh, nylon stockings, which were first introduced in 1939 at the World Fair, um, they actually became very important. <laughs> They became very important in the, during the Second World War. I'm sorry, I'm laughing because uh, these were these were tales which were told to me when I was a, when I was a kid, when I was a child. Uh, the uh, the stereotype of the American soldiers which came, who came to Europe, uh, came to the UK and then uh, went to France and fought in D-Day. Um, they arrived with cigarettes and uh, packets of nylons for the ladies, and of course that was a big hit. That made them a big hit. Um, but joking apart, it's uh, as a material, it's actually extremely versatile and extra. It, it's clear it doesn't meet all of the characteristics of silk, but silk is um, is not available on a on a on, on a large scale uh, on such a large scale. Okay. Uh, okay, so the nylon flag, which is out there on the moon somewhere, is uh, planted by it was planted by Neil Armstrong. Um, although Carruthers himself was, uh, it was a rather a rather tragic figure. Um, he uh, he was uh, extremely um, he was ill with uh, bipolar uh, bipolar disorder. Okay, so again, 1930s polystyrene. Um, this is another form. This is the other form of polystyrene. This is the crystalline form, which um, is similar to polycarbonate um, in that it's uh, it's transparent and it can be used as a as a as a glass uh, type of substitute. Um, but uh, okay, yeah, this is another musical reference. Um, this is another polystyrene, but most of you probably don't remember who she is. Um, so, way, 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 way back in the early in the early 1800s, 1840 or so, um, a guy called Simon, uh, Simon, Simon, uh, actually extracted uh, styrol from um, uh, a type of tree in uh, in America, and he noticed that this extract solidified. Basically, what he'd done is he'd polymerized styrene which was made by the tree um, a French guy Berthelot, uh, Berthelot um, described the described a, a more let's say 
uh, a more refined process, but it was actually uh, Ige Farben in uh, 1931 who actually, oh, which actually started to use um, polystyrene to replace zinc. So uh, zinc obviously is a metal. It's used for certain types of uh, types of pieces in machines, um, and it, it has its advantages and disadvantages. But you can imagine that one of those disadvantages is that you're working with hot me hot liquid metal, which is not uh, not exactly the easiest stuff to work with. Um, polystyrene is a lot easier, and so this was the beginning of. Uh, metal pieces being replaced with uh, with plastic okay um, this is probably the form that we are most familiar with it's plastic cups packaging this type of stuff um, it's not particularly chemically resistant but it's great for thermal stuff uh, if you want to keep a cup of hot a uh, cup of coffee uh, hot or warm and you need a cheap container, uh, polystyrene is uh, is good for this. Um, it can be foamed so that it can make a very good insulator um, and it can also be used um, for in a rigid form uh, such as uh, for making uh, compact disc covers um, knives and spoons and forks this is typically um, use uh, single use uh, cutlery that type of thing which is obviously not a uh, not a great uh, not, a gr not a great thing let's say um, okay so just a little bit after just a little bit after polystyrene um, DuPont again so DuPont have a lot of have a lot of activity or had a lot of activity in this area um, now this is one of the one of the examples of uh, serendipity um, and serendipity is this idea that uh, it's the right being in the right place at the right time but with the right preparation and in this case um, well, this is a, a science lab with some of the brightest, uh, some of the brightest sciences, scientists and engineers um, in the industry, and they were actually they were actually researching uh, refrigeration. They were researching um, gases to use in uh, refrigerators. Um, and one of the thing, one of the gases they were looking at was uh, a gas called uh, uh, tetrafluoroethylene, and they were playing with this to see it, to to, to look at its uh, its characteristics in terms of um, uh, uh, compression and uh, cooling effects, um, and they needed <coughs> they needed to use cylinders of uh, of, of this uh, tetrafluoroethylene um, and one time they had a cylinder which didn't open or well it opened but nothing came out I mean these are cylinders with gas and it's under pressure um, and nothing came out so they said whoa whoa well what's happened and what you can see in the photograph here is they've actually they actually they took a metal saw and they cut the cylinder in half and they noticed that inside and the inside they found that um, uh, the cylinder was coated with a white powdery waxy substance and so the uh, the question was well what's happened there now the thing with the serendipity is that um, when something like this happens these guys are actually looking for something completely different when something like this happens um, you've got two choices you can say oh well uh, my experiments failed because this stuff is no good but I'll just get another cylinder and just carry on <laughs> okay or you can say oh, I wonder what's happened and these guys in particular Roy Plunkett asked the question I wonder what's happened um, and so they found this white stuff um, and it it actually took them uh, it actually took them a long long time to work out 
what had actually happened, but it was quite clear that the, the tetrafluoroethylene had polymerized. And the polymerization had been caused by the fact that the cylinder was made of impure steel. It had tiny, 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 tiny amounts of nickel. Um, and nickel had cat the presence of the nickel had catalyzed the polymerization. Okay, so that's an example of the, of the the need for a catalyst. If the cylinder had been made of better quality steel, they would never have found the Teflon. Okay, so it's really quite a, a really quite an, an, a curious example. But then, of course, they had the question: Well, what what do we do with this? Um, so Teflon itself, uh, of course, we associate it with uh, with uh, non-stick surfaces, non-stick frying pans, which may or may not uh, be good for you in the sense that um, these are polyfluoroalkanes and these things can uh, have uh, can have effects on on health. However. Um, as a surface, it's actually it's actually very useful because it can be used for um, artificial uh, implants, for, for medical implants, in particular because um, uh, using, for example, joints or valves, heart valves, um, because it's so inert as a as a material, it's just not uh, it's just not recognised by the body. Okay. So um, it's uh, it's actually quite a, it's quite a curious material. Um, there's a rather facetious comment here, but I think this is also true that sometimes it seems like politicians are coated in it too. Nothing seems to stick to them, but that's just me being uh, polemical. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, oh, the this what this won't jiff. It's a jiff. Um, it's a gecko or a jekyll, which is uh, running up a, a non-stick frying pan. Uh, Jekos are, are famous for being able to stick to just about anything, but they cannot stick to Teflon. Um, there are some very interesting physical reasons for this. For, we don't need to go into that. Um, yeah, Diana's just made a comment about lots of science, science discoveries uh, were made by accident. Yes, this is absolutely true. Um, the key thing is being able to recognise when to, uh, you know, to to recognise when to ask why. Um, Okay, and then we have polypropylene, that's the Ziegler nat, that's nat and this is Ziegler. Um, we have polystyrene being blown, this is 1950, so this is the expanded polystyrene, which we are all f uh, familiar with, and which I think is starting to slowly be um, reduced uh, in terms of uh, using, use, use in packaging. Um, because expanded polystyrene um, is actually recyclable, but the problem is that it's extremely expensive to handle because it's extremely light and it takes up a lot of space. Okay, so um, you have to, in some way, compact it, but it's not uh, it's not so easy. Um, Okay, uh, something else which is associated with uh, um, uh, the 1950s, Velcro. Uh, Velcro was, uh, uh, dis well, it was discovered, it was created by a French engineer, a uh, chemical engineer, who got his inspiration from nature. Um, these are burrs and it's a type of plant which produces seeds which have hooks on them and the from an evolutionary point of view uh, the seeds stick to the coats of animals uh, the fur of animals uh, passing by and of course they get dispersed um, he went walking went hiking and uh, he went through a forest and he came back and found his trousers had these uh, these burrs uh, attached to them and he said oh, I wonder if this could be useful because you can take them off and stick them back on again um, 
and so from this uh, obviously the, the let's say the technical challenges of reproducing this uh, are not so straightforward it's not an easy thing to do but velcro was born um, this is a, an example of uh, this is a f an electron micrograph of velcro this is the hook part and this is the uh, the other part okay um, where <laughs> Whereas this this thing here um, is just incredible. Um, the, there is a tradition in a place called Queensbury near Edinburgh, um, and I, this happens. This takes place in May June, t June time. You can see the the burrs are still green, um, and basically one one guy. It's usually a, well, it is a man who does this. Um, he gets dressed in a special suit and the suit gets covered in these things but when they're still green okay so it's just the, um, from head to foot uh, he only has his hands free and a couple of holes for his eye and, <laughs> eyes in his mouth um, and he spends all day with the help of two helpers walking through the town of Queensbury um, if you don't believe this there are videos on YouTube um, of course, he drinks quite a lot of whiskey during the day to uh, help him <laughs> to help him get through the uh, get through the, the thing. So this is an old tradition going back hundreds of years. The Burry Man of Queensland, um, and then we have Kevlar, 1966. Kevlar is another Dupont pro uh, product. He looks like a superhero. It's actually an advert for a um, for um, a motorcyclist's. Uh, armor let's say um, and then of course we've got uh, the 1960s 1970s um, which would not have been the same without these uh, without these these, these uh, without the presence of polyester okay um, some countries like uh, Australia have been experimenting for a long time now with uh, plastic uh, banknotes okay this is this is a cash but it's not plastic cash um, and now I think the uh, sort of joking apart this is where this is something which is becoming ever ever more pressing is the um, uh, the presence of microplastics uh, in the environment because what's become what's become clear over the last 10 years or so is that um, plastics get into the environment and they're causing uh, they're causing problems like uh, the accumulation in the lake that we saw right at the beginning um, but of course the environment is not static the the plastic doesn't just stay there it degrades it's part now part of the environment so just like the rocks just like rocks are broken down into small rocks which are broken down into um, grains of sand which are broken down into dust um, and there's a whole process of let's say degradation um, plastic does exactly the same and uh, it's it's curious that it's also telling I think not just curious it's also telling that the um, our attention has only really just been brought to this uh, um, to this problem because we hadn't really considered it before um, maybe a case of out of sight out of mind but uh, certainly um, microplastics are now becoming recognized as a major uh, as a major problem and until uh, until recently um, it was assumed that this was associated with water and, uh, and the sea um, but actually it's now been found that microplastics are present in the air because plastics can break down into dust and as we saw in uh, our earlier uh, sessions where we talked about sort of pollution moving around the globe um, uh, 
this the, the, the dust can be so light that it just spreads all over the place um, so just a few words before I finish today just a few words about um, microplastics so um, this definition for less than five millimeters in length but typically we're talking microns so that's um, so that's thousands thousandth of a millimeter okay um, it's it's still pretty it's still pretty big on a microscopic scale but it's very small on a human scale uh, where do these things come from well um, they come from the breaking uh, the, the process of breakdown but there is also uh, there's also some deliberate use of microplastics which is something which needs to be addressed um, from a regulatory point of view I think because they are found in many cosmetics um, but of course the problem is that many cosmetics and creams are used uh, and then washed off and so these plastics are washed into the uh, washed into the into the water system um, and they can be too small to filter so they they can't be easily removed um, before uh, before uh, releasing the water to the to the sea um, so we've got things like primary microplastics uh, which are um, found in personal hair c um, products for example for personal care products uh, pellets which might be used in my manufacturing that's the, the resin pellet, pellet um, fibers um, and these can enter the uh, environment uh, as the product is used so for example a pile jumper uh, every time you wash a pile jumper a certain amount of uh, a certain amount of fiber is uh, is released into the water um, abrasion every time you uh, you rub again rub these uh, materials up against something um, the uh, small amounts of microfibers can be uh, released but of course small amounts are released from one pile jumper but how many pile jumpers are being washed in the world so this is uh, this is one. Then the second secondary microplastics are those which are caused by weathering. This is the natural geological process of, um, of breaking something down. So it's the action, a mechanical action of waves or wind or water, um, and it's also the the. Um, the action of the the physical action of ultraviolet light and, and heat from sunlight um, so sometimes um, biodegradable plastics may be um, may be made such that they are uh, they can be broken down by uh, ultraviolet radiation um, uh, so the the sunlight actually sort of start, uh, helps them break up. Um, in other cases, it's simply aging, it's simply weathering, and sometimes you see this on um, pieces of plastic which are uh, exposed over a long time. They start to they start to become uh, brittle and fragile, and pieces break off. And so you can imagine that it doesn't take much imagination for uh, to understand how that becomes um, uh, how that leads to extremely small pieces contaminating um, uh, contaminating things okay so the health impacts uh, there's no biodegradation here um, now Part of this, and I think I'll be I'll be saying something about this next time, maybe. Um, part of this is that most plastics are very are very modern, very recent, and evolution works on even bacterial evolution works on a 
uh, a time scale at least for, for this type of thing, uh, for this type of process. It works on time scales which are much longer. Um, although there are now reports of particular bacteria which are able to uh, which are able to dis de degrade uh, certain types of plastic. Um, so the the health effects are still, let's say, relatively unknown. But uh, I think we can agree that probably um, breathing in microplast microplastics in dust is probably not a good idea. Okay, I'm going to st I'm going to stop there because I think this next section is a little bit longer. So let me just make a note of where I've got to. If anyone has any questions or any comments, uh, we can I can open I can answer stuff on the chat, or as it as stuff comes up, I will. Has anybody got any any questions or any comments about uh, what we've talked about today? Oceans are full of microplastic. Um, yeah, yeah, it's become recognised that there's a lot of plastic around. Let's say, and yeah, we do eat them. Yes, uh, I think it's uh, where is it? It's on this one. Yeah, from <laughs> it's a little bit. Let's say uh, I write face to fish. Yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, and Kamal's saying microplastics will be accumulated in our bodies in different ways, yes. Yeah, so if you remember what we said about um, uh, what we said about certain types of environmental pollutants which accumulate in the food chain, um, as apex species, we will, uh, we will accumulate we rec we will accumulate these things as we uh, as we eat more as we eat more contaminated. F <laughs> um, yeah, uh, well, we are. Let's say we are accumulating these things. So um, it's difficult to imagine that we're not uh, we're not already sort of doing this now. Hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, but anyway, um, what I wanted to try and do here is I just wanted to try and give you a, um, a flavour as to um, why we have so many different types of plastic and uh, how even... Uh, even trying to replace some of these plastics is going to be difficult because uh, what we need to, I think we need to be more intelligent about how we make these things and how we use these things um, but I can't see how we could possibly do without do without them I think okay uh, we have no suitable alternative to plastics in many areas. Yes, yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. Uh, what we do, what, where we can start, though, uh, I'm getting a little bit depressed about this now. Where we <laughs> where we can start, though, is to um, uh, is to look very carefully about how we use things. So, for example, uh, rather than using plastic uh, knives and forks. You use metal knives and forks which you can wash or use your <laughs> use your fingers um, okay uh, oh okay so I, I'm not sure about the um, eating the equivalent of a credit card uh, is it true that 90 percent of salt is no oh whoa whoa whoa, whoa. right okay right 90 percent of salt is made of Microplastic. That is a rather uh, a rather large claim, uh, and I think we could probably test that. I don't think that is true. That's uh, that that looks like um, a number which has been uh, uh, 
have been invented, but it could be that 90% of salt samples contain microplastic, which is a different thing, because uh, salt, sea salt, is most salt commercially is sea salt, um, and so it's made by evaporating seawater. So if there is, or if there are micro particles in the seawater, they will end up in the salt as the water goes away and it's just left as uh, left as a solid. So um, I can imagine it might be 90% of samples of salt, which is not the same as 90% of the sample is, is plastic. That would be a different thing. I think you would notice something when you cooked with it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it uh, personal responsibility. Yeah, uh, it's personal responsibility. So, uh, okay, I think um, yeah, I think we just have to be, we have to start getting into the habit of thinking about, you know, do I need that thing? Can I use something different? But in many cases, I'm just looking at these te these television screens here. I cannot imagine how they would they could be made in a different way. But I'm not going to throw these away tomorrow. Okay, I'm going to keep these until they until they they break. Okay, so um, thank you, thank you again, everybody. I hope I hope it was <laughs> hope it was okay, um, and we will uh, we will continue next time, and we will move into sustainable cities at some point. So, okay. Thank so you, thank you very much, everybody, and catch up in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you very much. I'll see you next time. Okay, um, thank you. A very nice picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you I very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>